Negro Wall Street was the name given to Greenwood Avenue of North Tulsa, Oklahoma, during the early 1900s. Because of strict segregation, blacks were only allowed to shop, spend, and live in a 35-square-block area called the Greenwood District. The circulation of black dollars only in the black community produced a tremendously prosperous black business district that was admired and envied by the whole country. Oklahoma's first African-American settlers were Indian slaves of the so-called Five Civilized Tribes. Chickasaws, Choctaws, Cherokees, Creeks, and Seminoles. These tribes were forced to leave the southeastern United States and resettle in Oklahoma in midwinter over the infamous Trail of Tears. After the Civil War, U.S. Indian treaties provided for slave liberation and land allotments ranging from 40 to 100 acres, which helps explain why over 6,000 African Americans lived in the Oklahoma Territory by 1870. Oklahoma boasted of more all-black towns and communities than any other state in the land. And these communities opened their arms to freed slaves from all across the country. Remarkably, at one time, there were over 30 African American newspapers in Oklahoma. Tulsa began as an outpost of the Creek Indians, and as late as 1910, Walter White of the NAACP described Tulsa as the dead and hopeless home of 18,182 souls. Suddenly, oil was discovered, and Tulsa rapidly grew into a thriving, bustling, enormously wealthy town of 73,000 by 1920, with bank deposits totaling over 65 million. However, Tulsa was a tale of two cities, isolated and insular, one black and one white. Tulsa was so racist and segregated that it was the only city in America that boasted of segregated telephone booths. Since African Americans could neither live among whites as equals nor patronize white businesses in Tulsa, blacks had to develop a completely separate business district and community, which soon became prosperous and legendary. Black dollars invested in the black community also produced self-pride, self-sufficiency, and self-determination. The business district, beginning at the intersection of Greenwood Avenue and Archer Street, became so successful and vibrant that Booker T. Washington, during his visit, bestowed the moniker Negro Wall Street. By 1921, Tulsa's African American population of 11,000 had its own bus line, two high schools, one hospital, two newspapers, two theaters, three drug stores, four hotels, a public library, and 13 churches. In addition, there were over 150 two- and three-story brick commercial buildings that housed clothing and grocery stores, cafes, rooming houses, nightclubs, and a large number of professional offices including doctors, lawyers, and dentists. Tulsa's progressive African-American community boasted of some of the city's most elegant brick homes, well-furnished with china, fine linens, beautiful furniture, and grand pianos. Mary Elizabeth Parrish, 
from Rochester, New York, wrote, In the residential section, there were homes of beauty and splendor which would please the most critical eye. Well-known African-American personalities often visited the Greenwood District, including educators Mary McLeod Bethune and W.E.B. Du Bois, scientist George Washington Carver, opera singer Marian Anderson, blues singer Dinah Washington, and noted Chicago chemist Percy Julian. T.P. Scott wrote in Negro City Directory, Early African-American business leaders in Tulsa patterned the development of Tulsa's thriving Greenwood District after the successful African-American entrepreneurial activity in Durham, North Carolina. After the Civil War, former slaves moved to Durham from the neighboring farmlands and found employment in tobacco processing plants. By 1900, a large black middle class had developed, which began businesses that soon grew into phenomenally successful corporations, especially North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company. Charles Clinton Spaulding was so successful with the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company that he was able to create a real estate company, a textile and hosiery mill, and the Durham Negro Observer newspaper. Durham Blacks also created a hospital, Mechanics and Farmers Bank, 1908, North Carolina Training College, 1910, Bankers Fire Insurance Company, 1920, and the National Negro Finance Company, 1922. However, living conditions in Durham were so substandard and working conditions so poor that the 1920 mortality rate among blacks in Durham was three times higher than the white rate. As of 1926, 64% of all African Americans in Durham died before the age of 40. These perilous working and living conditions were not present in Tulsa. On May 31st, 1921, the successful Black Greenwood District was completely destroyed by one of the worst race riots, if I may interject the word, slaughters, in U.S. history. A 19-year-old Black male accidentally stumbled on a jerky elevator and bumped the 17-year-old white elevator operator who screamed. The frightened young fellow was seen running from the elevator by a group of whites and by late afternoon the Tulsa Tribune reported that the girl had been raped. Despite the girl's denial of any wrongdoing, the boy was arrested and a large mob of 2,000 white men came to the jail to lynch the prisoner. About 75 armed African Americans came to the jail to offer assistance to the sheriff to protect the prisoner. The sheriff not only refused the assistance, but also deputized the white mob to disarm the blacks. With a defenseless black community before them, the white mob advanced to the Greenwood District, where they first looted and then burned all black businesses, homes, and churches. Any black resistors were shot and thrown into the fires. 
when the national guard arrived they assisted the others by arresting all black men women and children and herding them into detention centers at the baseball park and convention hall as many as four thousand blacks were held under armed guard in detention dr arthur c jackson a nationally renowned surgeon and called by the mayo brothers of mayo clinic fame the most able negro surgeon in america was shot at the convention hall and allowed to bleed to death The Chicago Tribune newspaper reported that whites also used private airplanes to drop kerosene and dynamite on black homes. <sighs> By the next morning, the entire Greenwood district was reduced to ashes and not one white was even accused of any wrongdoing, much less arrested. The race riot of Tulsa, Oklahoma was not an isolated event in American history. On May 28, 1917, a white mob of over 3,000 in East St. Louis, Illinois, ravaged African American stores, homes, and churches. Eyewitnesses reported that over 100 blacks were gunned down as they left their burning homes, including a small black child who was shot and thrown back into the burning building to die. Seven white police officers charged with murder by the Illinois Attorney General were collectively fined $150. During the red summer of 1919, over 25 race riots where white mobs attacked black neighborhoods were recorded. In the 1919 race riot at Elaine, Arkansas, white mobs killed over 200 African Americans and burned their homes and businesses. Federal troops arrested hundreds of blacks trying to protect their possessions and forcibly held them in basements of the city's public schools. Twelve blacks were indicted, no whites, and convicted of inciting violence and sentenced to die. The NAACP persuaded the U.S. Supreme Court for the first time in history to reverse a racially biased Southern Court. 
Director John Singleton exposed the horror of the Rosewood Florida Massacre of 1922 in his film entitled Rosewood. A white mob burned down the entire town and tried to kill all of its black inhabitants. In April 1994, the Florida legislature passed the Rosewood Bill, which awarded $150,000 to each of the riot's nine eligible black survivors. After the Tulsa riot, the white inhabitants tried to buy the black property and force black people out of town. No Tulsa bank or lending institution would make loans in the riot-marred Greenwood district, and the city refused all outside assistance. However, racial pride and self-determination would not permit the Greenwood owners to sell, and they doggedly spent the entire winter in tents donated by the American Red Cross. Rebuilding was a testament to the courage and stamina of Tulsa's pioneers in their struggle for freedom. Most of the buildings along the first block of Greenwood Avenue were rebuilt within one year. Henry Whitlow wrote, A little over a decade after the riot, everything was more prosperous than before. In 1926, W.E.B. Du Bois visited Tulsa and wrote, Black Tulsa is a happy city. It has new clothes. It is young and gay and strong. Five little years ago, fire and blood and robbery leveled it to the ground. Scars are there, but the city is impudent and noisy. It believes in itself. Thank God for the grit of Black Tulsa. Like Black Tulsa, African Americans can continue to survive by self-pride, self-help, and self-determination. is my Africa is my home. Africa is your home. 